Hello, and welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, a community approach to departmental collaboration, engaging faculty and campus partners. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I am Publishing Director with Open Education Network. If you're not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. I will go ahead and drop that link into the chat. Before we go any further, as many of you know, the OEN is based at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. The campus is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and with each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and people. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. And with that acknowledgement, I'll hand things over to Lauren Ray from University of Washington. Lauren is a member of the Summit Planning Committee who will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Hi everyone. Uh, so as we begin the session today, we'd like to share a few important details with you. Um, so the webinar today is being recorded. Uh, for that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted to the OEN 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. And I will pop that link in the chat here. Um, and today we're going to have presenters from two institutions and the last portion of each of their presentations will be left for some um, time for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will not have a chance to, uh, to ask all of the questions to presenters, but we'll try our best. The chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at the link that I'm about to drop in the chat, which is z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. There's that link. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Hashtag for the summit is hashtag OEN Summit 21, and you can join us on Twitter at, at OpenEd underscore network. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Um, so we have Mandy Goodset, Performing Arts and Humanities Librarian, OER and Copyright Advisor at Cleveland State University. Emily Zickel, Assistant Lecturer in First Year Writing at Cleveland State University. Heather Capret, Senior Media Developer and Instructional Designer in the Center for E-Learning at Cleveland State University. We also have Ashley Morrison, Talker Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. Lydia, Fle sorry, Lynn, Lydia Fletcher, Physical and Mathematical Sciences Librarian at University of Texas at Austin. And Ian Goodtail, uh, European Studies Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. So welcome presenters and take it away. Thanks. All right, hello everyone. Thanks Lauren for that great introduction. Um, we're really thrilled to be part of this wonderful summit. Uh, my name is Mandy again, and today Heather, Emily and I are going to be talking about a program that we implemented in August of 2020 and May of 2021 to increase the number of faculty advocates on our campus. The program, which we called the Textbook Affordability Summer Symposium, and which was coordinated by our OER committee and funded by our provost office, involved a training component, 
a faculty OER review component, and various faculty advocacy elements. So next slide, please. All right, so our library has been offering small grants for adoption and creation of OER since 2016, and we've had pretty good success with that. We've had dozens of faculty participate now. So why were we interested in creating something new? Well, first, um, and some of you may have experienced this if you have um, a little bit of a more mature program. Initially, our grantees tended to be early adopters on our campus, those who are already willing to say yes to things. We're doing creative and exciting things with students in the classroom. And um, we kind of worked through those folks and we really wanted to bring other faculty on our campus who maybe had heard about open education, but were uncertain about it or um, weren't sure where to begin. We wanted to bring them on board and really begin to change our campus culture. So to do that, we needed a program that was accessible to a lot of faculty and had an educational element so that they could learn the information they needed to know. We also had a lot of success bringing in a speaker from OpenStax, Nicole Finkbeiner, although she is no longer at OpenStax, she is amazing. And she came to our campus in September of 2019. And she spoke with faculty, administrators, students, librarians, department chairs, instructional designers, and others. So pretty much everyone we could get her in front of. And she raised a lot of excitement about open on our campus. So we really didn't wanna lose that momentum. So we needed to offer something new that faculty could sign up for and participate in. Finally, we had started to get applications for our grant program. Um, and I'm curious what you all think about this. We had faculty applying who didn't necessarily understand what open education was about. They were making assumptions about maybe the, fact, the library just buying material for them as part of their grant. Um, or they, they weren't really aware of what resources could replace their commercial textbook. And so it became really kind of awkward and difficult to decide whether to award them grants or to have a fruitful grant project. So the symposium was kind of a scaffold. It was a learning opportunity, a chance for faculty to see what was out there before applying for one of our grants. Okay, next slide. So to make this symposium happen, here are some of the steps that we took. So together, our OER committee, which is made up of a lot of stakeholders from across our campus, created a proposal for a symposium and we brought it to our provost office. And we were pretty bold. We asked for $600 per participant stipend with up to 20 participants. And we were really thrilled and excited when the provost accepted our proposal and agreed to fund it. And we'll talk later about what to do if you don't have such good fortune. Um, we initially planned to offer the program in person in May of 2020, but we were forced by the pandemic to move it online and postpone it until August of 2020. So that gave us a little time to develop the curriculum completely in our learning management system Blackboard, and then promote it as much as we could to our faculty. We were blown away by the response from faculty. We usually don't get, honestly, really a lot of participation. And we had for 20 slots, almost 30 faculty apply. So we couldn't even give a slot to everyone. So we reviewed the applicants. And if you're interested in the rubric that we used, we can share that with you to choose 20 faculty. And then each participant sent us their syllabus so that a librarian could review it and map it to affordable resources, which I'll explain in a moment. Then the participants completed some Blackboard modules over the course of about three weeks. And then they had the rest of that academic year to meet the other requirements of the symposium, like adoption and presenting, which Heather will describe a little bit later. Okay, next slide. So our first symposium was so successful. We were excited to get funding to offer it again, just this past May. So the Blackboard component just finished. So here are how the tasks I described fall on a timeline for our 2021 planning. So you can check that out later in our slides. Okay, next slide. So um, what were the elements that composed our symposium? We'll talk about that next. So first, as I mentioned, each participant submitted a syllabus for a librarian or an instructional designer to review and then map to open or affordable content. 
And for each major course topic, we found one to three affordable options for that faculty member. And this was important. We described how they could use the resource. It was still often very mysterious to them. If we just put CC by, that didn't really tell them uh, enough information. Um, and they often confused openly licensed and library licensed content. So we could actually explain, here's how you can use this item. Um, credit goes to my colleague, Ben Richards, for developing the syllabus map document that we used. Um, it's openly licensed and it will be in a folder that we will link to at the end of our presentation if you wanna use it as well. Many faculty, as we'll discuss later, decided to use one or more of the OERs we provided for them on their syllabus map to replace a commercial textbook. So this part of the symposium was really successful. So now I'll turn it over to Heather to describe how the other symposium elements worked in more detail. Hi, everybody. I'm going to, um, I just want to jump into the Blackboard course so you get a visual of what it looks like. Um, this was the first part of our symposium that we had participants go through. Um, it was a Blackboard course with four modules. And in the first module, we explained what OER are, what's open pedagogy. We introduced them to Creative Commons licensing and the five rights that come with those six licenses and talked about other affordability issues. In module two, we had our participants review one of the OER that was mapped to their syllabus topics by their subject matter librarian. And if they chose an open textbook library book, um, it, we made them use the OTL rubric for their review, which was developed by BC Campus. Um, Mandy would help them publish their review on the OTL site. Um, and then in the third module, we had them create a course alignment map for just one module where they looked a little bit more in depth at their OER or affordable learning material and selected chapters or pages or particular article that supported their measurable, measurable learning objectives and their activities and assessment types. In module four, we had them write a final report where they talked about how their perspective and knowledge of OER may have evolved or changed over the three weeks of the course um, to talk about how they're going to implement their OER or affordable learning resource in their fall and spring courses. And also talk about how they're going to advocate for the use of that OER or affordable learning resource with other faculty in their department who may be teaching the same course, but different sections of it. And some of them talked about how they were going to advocate for OER use in general within their department. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of time. You do have all the contents of this course in a Google Drive folder, which we'll share on our last slide. But I wanted to just introduce you briefly to the structure of our modules. We always had a module organizer at the top that listed our learning objectives for them, followed by a to-do list of the types of activities and any assessment types and when they were due um, to keep them on track over the three weeks. This was followed by a link to an asynchronous discussion forum in Blackboard. In the first module, we used this for introductions and they could talk about past experience with any OER or open pedagogy or what their hopes or aspirations were. Um, in sub subsequent modules, the other three modules, this was used as a place where they could post questions for us about the module content. It was also a nice place for us as facilitators to post follow-up resources for them um, from our talk within li live Zoom sessions. So the types of resources we might uh, post there are like uh, links to the OER Commons license selector for people who are interested in writing their own OER. Um, we had three Zoom sessions, and these were informal question and answer sessions. We invited participants to introduce themselves. Um, this added a nice uh, social presence to the course, which is part of the community of inquiry framework in online learning. And so they would turn on their webcams, we get to see their faces, hear their voices, we could hear frustration in some that were trying to advocate for the use of a specific OER textbook, say in organic chemistry, or the aspirations and hopes of another who wanted to write their own OER following the symposium. 
Um, we had one medieval philosophy instructor who wanted to take writings from the internet archive and do his own modern interpretations of those in press books. Um, so this was a really nice component to the course. And I don't have a lot of time to really dig into the content, but I will say that we took advantage of other people's freely available OER resources, which are very thankful for. One of them was Abby Alder, and she put together an OER uh, starter kit. And so we used her very nice video on introduction to open educational resources, pulled charts from the Bureau of Labor Statistics to really drive home how the price of textbooks and the education has outpaced the increase in cost of other expense, living expenses and medical care. Um, so let me go back into our presentation. I'm going to fast forward through these topics that I discussed. The second part of our symposium required them to do a presentation. Um, so they would talk about their implementation of their OER in their course in fall or spring. They could do this with Mandy in our open textbook workshops that we run here at CSU. They could do a poster presentation for our Provost Teaching and Learning Summit, which is what one uh, human anatomy instructor did. And you can check out these resources later. I put a, a link to them. Uh, some people chose to do a five minute video testimonial talking about their use of their open educational resource, why they did it and the benefits for their students. So in 2020, Mandy um, explained that we had more applicants uh, pre-pandemic. I think people weren't as stressed at that time and overwhelmed. So 17 successfully completed the course. We did have a few inactive that dropped out, which is what we typically see in professional development courses on our campus. But we wanna say, we thought it was a huge success because 11 of them committed to switching from a commercial textbook to an open textbook. And in 2021, we had uh, slightly fewer, maybe due to the stress of all the online work from the pandemic, 14 successfully completed, just a few dropped out, and 13 committed to switching from a commercial textbook to a free alternative. And I'd like to add that four of them chose a textbook in the open textbook library, and one of them chose an organic chemistry textbook in LibreText. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Emily. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so what did the faculty say about this? Uh, coming off of now two years of um, stressful teaching, as Mandy said at the beginning, um, we, we were not looking for the people who were already incredibly interested in OER or even affordability initiatives. Um, or who saw themselves as OER advocates or even affordability advocates. But one of the things that we feel has been successful about the symposium is that our faculty, when surveyed um, at the end of the symposium, both in 2020 and in 2021, strongly claim that they identify as an advocate for OER um, or for affordability. I think it's really helpful to talk to faculty about, in some cases, what they are already doing um, and trying to keep costs low and, and, and really encouraging faculty to take on that identity. Um, our responses on the survey indicate that faculty um, do strongly agree or agree, and they overwhelmingly strongly agreed, um, that the symposium helped them to understand more about OER. Um, and that they were walking away from the symposium with some useful ideas on how to promote affordability in their own courses. So we, we do feel that we have maybe pushed the needle a little bit into um, maybe engaging some of the toe, toe dippers, the people who are curious, but, but haven't really taken the plunge into fully exploring OER to um, change their minds a little bit. Next slide, please. Oops, there we go. Um, I think we skipped one. Did we just skip one? Yeah, so the things that the participants liked the most um, based on the exit surveys were the email communication with us and email communication 
um, could mean direct emails from our, our Outlook accounts or emails through uh, the Blackboard course management system announcements um, and also the Zoom sessions. And the OER review assignment is something that participants found to be quite helpful. That was one of the early assignments where they used the materials that were mapped to them from the librarian um, and then they reviewed it. And participants also very strongly um, reported liking the module page overview. If you are ever to do something like this in, on your campus, I, I think this is useful information to have. And Heather showed you one of the module overview pages. Next slide, please. Some things that maybe were not incredibly helpful, these were the responses that didn't rate overwhelmingly high among faculty responses were that the discussion posts weren't super useful um, to faculty. The course map activity and the final report were long and challenging assignments for faculty. Um, so I think these two assignments received slightly lower responses in the somewhat helpful or not helpful range. Definitely um, very few responses here, but these are their challenging assignments. Um, and then the Zoom session helpfulness, the way that faculty reported on that in 2020 had many more, oh, this is somewhat helpful. And then in 2021, we made the Zoom component not optional, but required faculty had to attend at least one Zoom session. And it's interesting that in 2021, when it was required, far more faculty reported that the Zoom sessions were helpful. Next slide. Um, well, there's no guarantee that we'll ever be able to offer this again. Uh, this is kind of a case by case sort of thing. We're planning and preparing for that hopeful possibility. So here are some things that we'd possibly change about the program based on our previous experiences and some of the faculty feedback that Emily just described. So while the syllabus mapping activity helped faculty, and I think it's a really important component of the symposium, um, we may move the process even earlier. It, you know, depending on the subject, sometimes there just aren't that many options for a faculty member and we have to get creative. So more prep time would help with that. Even though the symposium had significant, a, a significant educational component, some faculty still struggle to, to understand the differences between commercial library licensed and openly licensed content. So going forward, we might provide some examples of what those look like so that they can better identify them in the future. Um, we noticed that some of our symposium participants, that we had a kind of a variety of folks. Some of them, despite electing to participate, seemed still kind of uncomfortable with OERs, while others were clearly kind of already doing this work, but maybe didn't have the language for it. And so we're thinking there's kind of an interesting opportunity to study what motivates a faculty member to participate in a professional development program like this. And that could help us recruit more faculty to participate and just give us information about how faculty end up on this path to OER adoption. And then finally, we have to rethink the timing of the symposium. The one we just had in May was especially troublesome. I think a lot of folks were really burnt out at that point. Um, but, you know, timing is like the age old question. So we'll maybe move it a little later into the summer going forward. All right, next slide. So if you're interested in offering a similar program on your own campus, here are some recommendations based on the lessons that we learned offering our summer symposium. First, uh, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, we don't have funding to give faculty $600 each. That's okay, something like this is still possible for you. There are lots of examples of learning circles, um, communities of practice, communities of inquiry, things like that, that um, have been successful even without the incentive of funding. So I don't know if Cheryl Coulier is here, but um, she has a great example on her campus. and Maybe she'd be willing to share information about it. Um, but think about on your campus, is there some sort of credential or credit option for faculty development? Is there another unit like a Center for Faculty Excellence or Development um, or a Center for E-Learning that offers some sort of professional development with a certificate or something like that? Can you hop onto what they're already doing? If you have some funding, but not a lot, um, the OEN has a really tried and true strategy of 
giving faculty some training, could be online training like what we did, and then giving them, um, and then asking them to review a textbook and giving them $200 to do so. And that really has worked well in a lot of uh, contexts. You could also just review syllab syllabi for faculty and just doing that alone, I think, is a really valuable service. We're trying to offer that as a separate service on our campus. Um, and it can really open doors and help faculty overcome that hurdle of finding material that works for them. So our second recommendation, we found a lot of value in helping faculty who are already doing affordability work kind of just relabel what they're doing and adopt the language of the open education community. So that might be a good place to start if you're trying to reach out to faculty to participate in this sort of program. If you can work with the team, split the grading up across several people. In our case, this was especially important uh, because for our first symposium, um, some of our staff were undergoing furloughs for three weeks at a time. So it was very difficult to plan this and it was essential that we worked as a team to do it. Um, another thing to consider is the end products that your participants will create and how they might be used by your open education program to inspire more interest in open education going forward. So for example, we asked faculty to do some sort of presentation and we help them create short videos if they're interested in that route. And those short videos have been so useful to us on our website and social media, you know, during Open Education Week. So, you know, with permission of the faculty member, see if you can reuse those end products um, to help with uh, your own program. And finally, don't reinvent the wheel, reach out to us if you have questions and feel free to use any of the work that we've already done. So on the next slide, um, there is a link to a folder that I will put in the chat um, with all the content from our Blackboard course, some other templates, uh, that syllabus review document, um, all is there for you to use if you'd like. If you go to the next slide. Um, and the slides have all these slides in there too. Oh, right, right. So, um, so great. So then you can get our contact information there as well. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So I think we have two minutes now for questions. Yeah, and we have a, a couple of questions that have come in through chat and a couple of folks who have raised their hand. I'm just going to go ahead and read the first question that came in through chat. Um, and yeah, we do have, I think, one minute left. So we'll probably just have time for that before handing it over to our next presenters. So um, Jonas Lamb um, asked, were the participating faculty on contract during the symposium? We have a lot of nine month faculty who are off contract from the second week of May through the second week of August. This gives us about two weeks prior to the fall term to run a symposium style faculty development workshop in a week at the end of spring term. How long did the symposium run? A week? It was three weeks this time around. Yeah. You're off contract. Okay, great. And I'm seeing another question that came in through the chat. If you do not receive funding from the provost, will you run the symposium? Will you still run the symposium? I think Great we'll question. definitely try. <laughs> it's a question we hope we don't have to answer. <laughs> but yeah, I think if we can find alternative funding or scale it down, or just like I was talking about, find other incentives, um, we would love to do it again. Great. Well, I think since we're at half past the hour, we're going to um, turn it over to our presenters from UT Austin. I know there's more questions that have come in and a few folks have raised their hands. Um, if you are able to type your question in the Q&A, um, we can do it that way. Um, and we also will have some time at the very end. So um, yeah, thanks for questions and we'll turn it over to UT Austin. All right, thank you so much. I'm hoping you can see my screen right now. Uh, I, this is a hard act to follow. I feel so inspired after hearing about what CSU is doing and it's great timing because we're thinking about similar programming here at UT Austin. So I'm looking forward to borrowing very liberally from the helpful content that you've shared. Um, but good morning, everybody. My name is Ashley Morrison. I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. It's a position that I've been in since August of last year. 
And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Lydia Fletcher and Ian Goodale, who are each liaison librarians here at UT, and they'll introduce themselves and their work a little bit more later on. Um, but we're going to tell you today about a pilot outreach program we ran this past spring with two academic departments on our campus. And the concept itself is really simple. It probably feels a lot like things that you're doing already, and we're just thinking about it in, with a framework in mind. So in my position, my charge is to work across campus to drive awareness and adoption of OER and other free and affordable course materials. And at an institution the size of UT Austin with more than 3,000, almost 4,000 instructors across 13 colleges and schools, uh, the prospect of even knowing where to start with outreach was pretty overwhelming for me when I was getting started, as I'm sure it has been for many of you too. And this felt compounded in some ways since I've been working remotely uh, the entire time I've been in this role. So I don't get to table at new faculty orientations and other events the way that I hope I will in these after times. Um, but as I began my regular activities supporting instructors who found me or who I'd met organically, I wondered how I could make meaningful progress introducing myself and making instructors aware of the support that I could offer when it's not feasible to just send an email to everyone saying hi. Um, so I thought about what it might look like to just focus on one department at a time with my proactive outreach and what I might learn about the department, what services they need, and how that could scale potentially to more departments or my general support levels for faculty. And simultaneously, of course, I obviously hoped it could influence OER adoption or creation in a targeted way. Um, I also wanna note upfront that piloting this outreach strategy didn't mean dropping other timely opportunities, um, whether they came to me or I saw a good reason to contact a faculty member. So when I saw new textbooks that I thought a particular instructor might be interested in, I still did my outreach to them and I kept accepting every opportunity to present that came my way regardless of the department. Um, this was really only about focusing my time to be proactive in a way that worked well for me. But to execute this plan, it was really important to partner closely with the liaison librarians who support each of our departments on campus. So at UT, liaison librarians serve as the subject specialists for an academic department. And it's a one-to-many relationship in which a liaison generally supports a few related departments, um, their faculty and their students, in addition to collection development responsibilities. And they know their departments and faculty really well, so they would be key to identifying departments that would make good candidates for this type of outreach, especially in a pilot phase, and for successfully connecting with faculty and leaders within the selected departments. So this was truly a collaborative effort that couldn't have happened without strong liaison librarian support. So to identify which department we wanted to work with for the pilot, I asked all of our liaison librarians to fill out a short Google survey um, for up to three of the departments that they support. And in the survey, I asked them questions about department size, um, generally how engaged and receptive the faculty seem, like do they tend to respond to their liaisons outreach normally? Do they embrace new ideas or are they often resistant to change? I also ideally wanted to work with departments that had some classes that might be high impact opportunities for OER conversion in the long term, like having some high enrollment introductory level undergraduate classes. Um, I let liaisons determine what high enrollment meant for their departments since that can really vary, but most who responded affirmatively to that question had some classes with 100 or more students enrolled. I also asked about whether or not they'd already had conversations about OER with anyone in the department, um, and if they were aware of any existing OER adoptions, or did they know of any high quality OER that could be a match for some courses. Even better would be if they knew faculty who'd adopted or authored OER who might be willing to speak to their colleagues about it. Most responded that they didn't know if there were any adoptions, authors, or high quality OER, but that was fine. And finally, I wanted to know if they, the liaisons, would be interested and available to work closely with me on a plan for outreach and those activities over the course of a semester. And that did rule out a few opportunities, but I was really glad for their candor, um, especially as a new staff member who's still trying to build relationships with my colleagues virtually. I didn't want to set unrealistic expectations or ask anyone to overcommit. 
So I set out to select one department, but I ended up picking two that are really different, um, the math department and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. They were both really good candidates for the pilot because they have a lot of faculty who are focused on instruction and many high enrollment courses, and they were really engaged and responsive contacts for us to start with. So sometimes that meant that they just had really big fans of the library within their department. Um, and But in these particular cases, they also had OER champions who we knew would be willing to speak on our behalf if asked, or just be really candid about who to talk to or what challenges um, might be in the department. But after the departments were identified, I worked with Lily and Ian respectively to develop a short action plan for each department. So in this plan, we identified some key relationships, including departmental leadership, relevant committees, um, faculty leads we should speak with, and campus partners who could be influential. And we also identified opportunities for course conversions and the instructors who teach those along with high quality OER that we already knew about. And in the action plan, we also documented the department's overall strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, or the SWAP model that you're probably familiar with as it relates to OER adoption. So for example, a strength might be that the department has a faculty champion who's willing to advocate for OER, but a weakness might be that they have curriculum committees who have to agree on all course materials for the large classes. Or a threat might be that we know some of the faculty who are vocal about their belief that OER are low quality. Um, but documenting all of this really helped us identify some specific goals, which for us were very much learning based because we know it's not realistic in most cases to convert any course to OER over the course of one semester, especially the big ones that we hope to influence long term. Um, and in a pilot, learning based goals really just feel appropriate. But if you're interested in seeing a template of the action plan that you can copy and make use of, there's a link on this slide, but Lydia is also going to drop a link into the chat for you. But to illustrate how our plans played out, Lydia and Ian are each going to take us through the goals we established for each department, our activities, and some outcomes and insights. So I'll turn it over to Lydia to talk about math first. Hello, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Lydia Fletcher and I'm the liaison librarian for the math department, um, among a few others. And I'm based in UT's Keeney Physics, Math and Astronomy Library. So I've always had a really uh, close connection to the math department because we're in the same building as the department offices are. Um, and they're also just really interested in the library in general. Um, so the math department at UT is one of the top ranked programs in the US with 51 tenured and tenure track faculty, 31 non tenure track faculty who serve primarily as instructional faculty uh, and nearly 100 graduate students and almost all of these folks participate in providing instruction because the department provides the foundational math classes for the entire campus, um, as well as providing specialized courses for the College of Natural Sciences and the College of Engineering and the Macomb School of Business, um, as well as for the UT teacher training program. Our goals for working with the math department were to gain insights into the level of awareness, adoption, and creation of OER within the department. And we also wanted to encourage the adoption of OER uh, or the flipping of materials that instructors were already creating to become open resources. So we began, we began by partnering with an OER advocate with the, within the department, a faculty member who had previously um, engaged with the OER activities within the libraries. Uh, and presented to the non tenure track instructional faculty cohort. The focus of the presentation was on turning videos, assignments, syllabi, etc., that they were already creating during the pandemic into open resources. And we followed this up by having a series of one on one semi structured interviews with both tenure track and non tenure track faculty over the course of the spring semester. What we found was that members of the department were really eager to work with Ashley and I to look for open resources. Um, the department has been working on creating a system of what they're calling course advocates who create a canvas course shell with basic materials such as syllabi, readings, homework problem sets, et cetera, for specific courses so that future instructors of that course have a starting point if they're either new to the department or they find themselves teaching a subject that they haven't before. 
And the course advocates were particularly excited to work with Ashley and I. And what we ended up doing is that we would investigate OER and also library owned or licensed materials that would be free for the students to access. Um, and then provide the instructors with lists of those resources uh, so that they could evaluate them and potentially incorporate them into those courses. Um, and in all, we ended up doing this for eight courses over the course of this last semester, which is a, a pretty amazing outcome, I think. Um, and there's more folks that have reached out to us and want to work with us in the future. So it's been, that was a really fantastic outcome. Um, another thing we found particularly was that instructional faculty were much more likely to either adopt or create OER for their courses than the kind of traditional research focused tenure track faculty, um, because their primary focus is on doing their research, publishing, getting tenure, those kind of traditional faculty things. Um, there was little incentive for them to either create or adopt OER because it doesn't count in their promotion and tenure evaluations. Um, we also found that even for instructional faculty, there needs to be better departmental and college guidelines for how to incorporate creation and even adoption of OER into their evaluation and reward structures so that faculty feel like they're not just doing it. Um, I don't want to say that they're not just doing it for nothing, because there is so much benefit to doing it, but if it's not recognized, then I think that there's there, there's kind of less of a, of a drive, you know, if it's something that you get recognized and rewarded for, then I think that that makes it even more likely faculty will jump on board. And over to Ian. Yes, thank you. So uh, again, my name is Ian Goodell. I'm the European Studies Librarian at UT. Um, so similar to Lydia, I'm a liaison librarian, um, both through the Dep Department of Spanish and Portuguese, as well as uh, a number of other departments on campus that cover um, pretty much the entire uh, European continent, kind of into Eurasia and Eastern Europe as well. Um, so this department is a bit smaller than the Department of Mathematics, um, a much smaller graduate student cohort, um, but it's still very influential on campus, particularly with its undergraduate Spanish language courses, um, and to a lesser extent, its Portuguese courses as well. Um, so a lot of the OER that's been created, we found, has been created around these Spanish language courses. Uh, to help undergraduates as they progress through the um, accelerated Spanish language program that we have here on campus. Um, so our goals in approaching the department were uh, pretty similar to the Department of Mathematics. Um, we wanted to gauge current interest in and activities related to OER within the department, um, and then see if we could promote adoption of additional OER materials uh, by faculty members as well. Um, so we started with some outreach to individual faculty members and different coordinators within the department. And we found that just emailing people individually from a list that we, Ashley and I, developed together based on some of my previous relationships with faculty members, um, and then research into current OER champions in the department um, as well. Um, so we just targeted a, a list of people and sent emails out to them. Um, from those emails, we got a, a number of different Zoom meetings. Um, obviously, everything is still remote here. Um, so we met with faculty members. We met with the department chair. Um, of the uh, department as well, and then some others, um, various coordinators um, and people in other roles within the department. Um, and then we also were able to, uh, by speaking with the department chair, get a presentation for the entire uh, members, uh, all of the members of the department um, at a meeting for faculty, um, which was a really great opportunity both to speak about what we were doing and what the pilot was um, as a way to outreach to people maybe we hadn't contacted individually, um, as well as just to hit home various library resources and how we're here for the department um, as well, maybe trying to reach out to some faculty members who have not developed strong uh, library relationships yet. Um, so our insights that we got were uh, that OER is already very widely known and respected within the department. Um, as I mentioned, they have a very large corpus of OER materials that they've created for their uh, Spanish language courses, and then to a lesser extent for their Portuguese um, materials as well. Um, and faculty are very open to discussion and consideration um, both around their current OER and then adopting uh, other OER materials in the future as well. Um, there's a pretty strong uh, culture of accepting um, and valuing OER work um, within the department. So it seems like there isn't too much uh, concern about you know, getting value from the department as people seek tenure, things like that for OER. Um, there's a very strong culture around that already. And I think I'll pass it back to Ashley. All right, thank you, Ian. And thank you to Lydia as well. 
I'm going to wrap us up um, by talking about a few of the takeaways that we had from this process. So for me, this approach was definitely valuable as a prioritization strategy. Um, there are over 100 academic departments and centers on our campus, and this approach allowed me to get to know a little bit more about a lot of them through the liaison form submissions, and then get to know just a couple better, um, test out some outreach strategies, and over time, hopefully apply what was successful to the other departments and contacts. Practically speaking, it also helped me personally feel a lot more organized and productive. Um, I think that for me doing a little bit of outreach across dozens of departments without a particular goal just wouldn't have felt as useful or satisfying in my first year in this position. So it was definitely something that I appreciated on that level. Um, I also think that the departments we selected allowed us to get engagement quickly because of the great relationships and the high level of trust that our liaisons already had. Um, there were engaged faculty and staff in all kinds of roles for both departments, um, and math in particular had a really active and vocal faculty champion that gave us the scoop um, when we needed it. And for Spanish and Portuguese, we also had access to a campus partner with a deep level of knowledge of past conversations about OER and the response to it um, that allowed us to tailor our approach in addition to all of those other great faculty relationships that Ian had. And the tactics that we used for each department were valuable in different ways. Um, in particular, structuring the outreach for the math department as semi-structured interviews was one of the most useful tactics that I found in this. Um, getting IRB approval to make it a formal study is always kind of a pain, um, but it was worth it for us because these interviews to raise um, served a few purposes for us. They raised awareness of OER and the specific services that the library can offer around that while also helping us better understand the needs of those faculty. Um, I think this is a structure that I'll continue to use because it was a good guide for our conversations. And again, I think that framing it as a study made those math faculty more interested in talking to us um, than they would have been if we would positioned it as openly as Ian and I were able to with Spanish and Portuguese faculty. Um, it was a different approach for two different departments, but I think that for some, the semi-structured interview approach would work well. Um, and finally, the duration of the effort felt about right. Um, we're running into the summer semester with our math department interviews. We have one right after this, um, but that's largely because we didn't get IRB approval until well into the spring semester with delays in that process. Um, however, I'll note uh, that limiting outreach to one department at a time would probably be wise. Um, I found myself focusing on one department at a time naturally, so I would kind of unintentionally halt outreach and progress with one department while I was working on another. So that's a change I'm likely to make. Um, but overall, this is a model I do intend to continue using during our long semesters. I think it'll be reasonable to continue selecting one department to focus in the spring and fall until I run out of good candidates or otherwise seem to reach a saturation point on our campus, which at its size is, is not likely to be anytime soon. So that's really all that we'd plan to share for today. We should have about 10 minutes left and we're happy to take questions. Um, feel free to keep sending them in the chat um, and we'll respond to them that way if we need to. And I know that there are plenty of questions that we didn't get to from um, the CSU group. So time permitting, maybe we can come back to some of those too. Wow, well, thank you so much. I'm like furiously taking notes and also trying to work as facilitator. This was so um, engaging, um, everyone, thank you. Um, so I'm seeing one more question that um, came in through the Q&A. So Maria um, Sclafani, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, said, I'm sorry if I missed this, but what was the status of OER at UT Austin before this pilot um, focusing on two departments? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say, and so I, I remember, Mandy may be talking about their program being pretty mature at CSU. Ours is slightly less mature. Um, we've had an OER working group on campus for a few years, but I think or hope at least that it has helped to have somebody in an open education librarian role, which I mentioned I've been in since August of last year. So I've been able to serve as coordinator for a lot of those efforts. 
that were taking place previously. And the way that I think most faculty on our campus would have heard about OER before um, outreach programs like this one would be through a few ways. One, obviously conversations with their liaison librarians like we were just talking about. There's a pretty high level of familiarity and comfort I think among our liaison librarians as a group in talking about OER. Um, so that's one way. We also, that OER working group had been hosting and continues to host a series of workshops on topics related to OER. Some really foundational ones like a 101 course, but also um, more hands-on ones like searching for OER, applying open licenses and understanding copyright, that sort of thing. So I would say um, we were less far along than some of the exciting things that I hear at CSU, but it's only because we, uh, we're a little bit newer to it and we haven't had somebody in a dedicated role until pretty recently. And if, if I can just add something. So I've been on the OER working group since it was started and that was about three and a bit years ago, I think in 2018. And so, yeah, we worked closely with things like the Faculty Innovation Center on campus to get the word out about what we were doing. But we did rely a lot on the liaison librarian contacts with the departments to promote those things. Um, and we had a lot of success with those, but having a having a dedicated position has definitely like made it so much easier because the working group was comprised of people who had other jobs and OER was something we cared about, but did not always have 100% time to dedicate to it. So having Ashley around has made it so much better uh, in terms of keeping the momentum of that going. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of the efforts in the OER were very dependent on the liaison librarians and their comfort level in doing that with their departments. So I, for example, was really excited to kind of work with my departments and, and physics and astronomy, which are two others that I work with, were already really excited. And math has kind of been one that's been slower to get there, but now there's a lot of momentum there. Um, so yeah, I think having a model where you have a functional specialist and then the liaison librarians able to work in tandem on different aspects of that is really going to change the game for us. Yeah, I think having a specialist like Ashley too also, you know, helps avoid people getting into departmental silos, which might happen if you have liaison librarians being the primary contact um, for this type of thing. Um, you could easily have people just kind of getting into their own subject areas without kind of bridging the gap and speaking with other people across campus, um, engaging with OER in different ways. Um, so it's really great to have someone in Ashley's position to help avoid that as well. Great, and it looks like we may have, yes, one more question that came in. So Etta Thornburg says, can you share the template for your semi-structured interview questions um, and have these interviews or informal relationships brought up questions or points that inspire further action? I'll answer the first part. Yeah, I would be happy to share the template for our semi-structured interviews. I don't have that ready to go right now, but Etta, I, I'm happy to reach out to you or if you'd like to contact me, I'll put my email in the chat. I can definitely share that with anybody who's interested. Um, it was based on some research that I did as a graduate student in a similar area, so it was nice to get to reuse something. Um, the second part of the question, have these interviews or informal relationships brought up questions or points that inspire further action? One of the things that really comes to mind for me is that through the research that we've done prior to speaking with a lot of the faculty members that we've conducted interviews with, both in the in both departments, um, we have learned about a lot of OER adoption or other free and affordable course materials adoption that I would have had no idea about otherwise because our faculty members are not super reliable about reporting those to our campus bookstore. And I get it, it doesn't seem like the kind of thing you would need to report if you don't need the campus to buy books uh, for your students. Um, but that's been something that I felt like I could take action on immediately because part of my role also involves tracking cost savings and other success metrics related to OER adoption. And I'm getting a better handle about what our benchmark is for that. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind, but I'll let Lydia and Ian chime in if there's something else that they wanna to add to that. I think for me, one of the things that has been really amazing coming out of talking with the math faculty um, is 
what they consider open resources to be. So a lot of faculty would say things like, yeah, I make open resources. I, I put my lecture notes up on my website. Um, and so getting to have that, like seeing how they interpret what that means. And also in some cases getting to change their definition from like OER equal textbook to OER equals all this other stuff. Um, that was really great. I was also kind of amazed at the quantity of open educational resources that were being created on the campus. So I kind of knew that there was involvement in, in some OER, but I hadn't realized the extent of it before um, because the math department was working on things in conjunction with, I think in particular with the business school, um, they were able to create a textbook for the course for the business school that they, they give. Um, and, and so it was really enlightening to me to see kind of the extent of, of their adoption and involvement and interpretation um, that I hadn't fully realized before. So it's been a great experience in, in my learning more about a department that I've been working with, but in a very different way, clearly for the last few years. Yeah, my experience was pretty similar to Lydia's too. Um, I was aware that there was a lot of OER being made in the department. Um, but I think in my my typical duties as a, as a liaison librarian, I didn't really overlap with that OER um, side of the department so much. Um, you know, I would do embedded instruction sessions and orientations and help develop the collections and things like that. Um, but I wasn't really directly speaking to faculty um, and lecturers in the department about the OER work that they were doing. So being able to get um, my name in there and get an inroad and start to speak to them about this other aspect of their work uh, was very uh, rewarding. Thanks, everyone. So I know we just have a few minutes left. And I noticed that Ronica Rooks um, raised uh, their hand a while back. So Ronica, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask a question? Okay, I'm not seeing a question come in, so it may have been um, may have been miss a misclick. But please feel free to um, share a question through chat. We are getting to the very end, so I'm not seeing. Oh, no worries, Rania. <laughs> Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, not seeing any other questions come in through the Q&A. This was such an amazing presentation and I am definitely gonna follow up with you guys afterwards. Um, and um, just making sure, yeah, um, there, I don't see any other questions that are coming in. Um, so I just want to um, give a, a big uh, thank you to Mandy, Emily, Heather, Ashley, Lydia, and Ian. Um, we really appreciate your sharing your expertise with us today. Um, we also want to thank you, audience, for joining us. And we want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be sharing, um, will be shared in the coming weeks. And you can subscribe to our YouTube playlist to receive a notification. I'm going to drop the link in the chat here for that. Slides and transcripts will also be linked. Um, and just a reminder that you can keep the conversation going by joining us on Slack. Um, and I'm gonna drop a link to our Slack um, OEN Summit 2021 also here in the chat. Um, and if you're an OEN member, we hope you'll also continue the conversation in the OEN Google group. So um, thank you all again for joining today's session and a huge thank you to our panelists.